because of density of cores in your processors increasing, or actually increasing floor space and resources? And uh, else? And the, the, the correct answer is both, yes. So the question is, is it because of uh, three-year replacement cycles? Not uh, quite uh, true. However, it turns out uh, that every couple of years, somebody comes up with a research idea, they write a proposal, it gets funded, they come with us with the money and said, let's you know, put it there, we get the bump. So it's not necessarily uniform because if you look at 2013 and 14, there was a big jump out there. So uh, it, it, it's largely grant driven. And then there's some institutional money. What we're trying to do now is in the past, they depended upon these grants. And if they didn't come, then you're stuck with what you have. So what we propose to the university is that and this is an idea that actually I got when I was working at General Motors, is give us a fixed amount of money and let us then decide when to spend it. And the beauty of that is that you can take the money and bank it, and then when Moore's Law catches up 18 months later, the next clock tick or talk, depending you know how you buy into Intel's philosophy, then we can use that accumulated dollars and then get bigger jumps. So we're doing it uh, a little bit differently. Uh, a lot of folks don't follow that method. Uh, I think it's because they are probably overruled by the accountants or you know people who do asset tagging and all that yeah. and all that. But what we said is, don't worry. Let it go a little out of date. That's fine right. because then uh, we can get a bigger jump once. Uh, so we we watch technology trends, and that's very important to us. So that way. You can always deliver the best bang for buck. Yeah. Jim, did you have a yeah. question? Yes. The, uh, these core counts you're talking about, you're going to move up to around 10,000. Know? Maybe more, yeah. Are you talking uh, standard like x86 cores, or are these NVIDIA? Cores? Oh, no, no. I have not included a single NVIDIA okay. in here, because so otherwise it would be crazy. <laughs> standard, standard yes, yes, cores. Yes, yes. Um, pretty soon, it's going to get a little foggy because the NVIDIA people are growing and they're coming out with interesting ideas that, uh, well, that'll be the last slide we'll talk about that, where, <laughs> where it's going. But just to make things easier, this is your classical x86 cores okay. that we're and talking you, about. I'm curious, when you count cores, mm -hmm. do you count hyper-threading or not? No, no, okay. no, no hyper-threading. Right. These are actual cores that uh, you can get reported. <coughs> and one of the other things that one has to fix when you get there is everyone has different terminology. They refer, oh, this node has two CPUs. I said, I don't think so. It has two sockets, yes. But inside a socket, you've got maybe, I don't know, 8, 6, 12, 14 cores. Mm -hmm. You know what? Each one of those cores is a full-fledged classical traditional sure. CPU. Sure. So get your terminology straight. And I'm surprised that seasoned folks out there, they still talk about, maybe, you know, it's uh, the mental model out there. But to me, when I say core, core is synonymous with a full-blown proper CPU, accumulator, register, <coughs> and all that sort of stuff. It can address everything. So that's the way I look at it. And I hesitate to count accelerator cores, because if you think about it, they're doing specialized stuff. They are cores, but they're acting under the direction that all the cores execute the same instruction. It's almost like if everyone in the room picked up a hammer and banged it at the table at the same time, that's what the accelerator is doing. So I, I kind of hesitate. But they're getting there where they're at the point where they'll be providing the hef heavy lifting muscle calculation, and the rest of these cores will be there to really support them. Supervising them. Yeah. Yes, yes, something like that. Oh, a little bit. You know, when you have these kind of resources and everyone says, oh, I want to use it. Well, naturally, just like you alluded to, if you come here after 6.30 or something, and you're, or before 6.30, you're stuck at the door. Yes, we have wait times as well. And just like the growth in the number of jobs or the growth in the number of CQ core hours, this is a growth too, the growth in wait time. It just simply means that there are more people trying to get through the same door to get at these resources. 
And the biggest jump is, guess where, out here in the GPU job. So if you look, they have to wait almost 300 minutes before the first job launches. I'm not talking about how long it takes to run. That's, you know, their headache. But uh, it certainly, this is where the biggest growth is. Wow. And again, I went, looked at the logs, got all the information, and I said, if we're going to buy something to replace, let's buy where it'll be most effective. Instead of, you know, saying, oh, this researcher needs this, let's buy it. And then you have an unbalanced system. So when I said, I think I need to buy more GPUs, they said, why? We don't use them. Why do you want to buy them? And I said, look at this figure. So, you know, I have a saying. Um, Five hours for your job. Um, in God I trust, everyone else has to bring data. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then they said, well, uh, just because the wait time is so high doesn't mean we need more GPUs. Maybe they don't know what they're doing. I said, well, uh, I have more data for you. There's simply more work. Because if it accelerates your work, why won't you use it? I mean, if you all were given I'm not going to use any foreign car uh, example, uh, a Mustang or yeah, Mustang. a uh, Corvette, <laughs> or maybe, I don't know, what's the, the Chrysler one called? Yeah. Viper. Viper, yeah, there you go. He'd say, sure, it runs fast, it's great, I feel good, I get there faster. So you'll use it, and that's what people are doing because it's working for them and there's third-party codes, there are codes they write, there's open source code. Um, when GPUs first came from NVIDIA maybe 10 years back, there were maybe like five codes in the whole world that ran on it. Today there's more than 300. So it has grown because it's uh, simply there. And of course, the biggest one is our user population has grown. I mean, like I said, that is about the same size that I had at General Motors, which is a gigantic company. So. Well, um, this is what it looks like, uh, the timeline, as far as I, December, I started working on it. We put out bids to vendors, and uh, actually sometime end of next week, I'll make the final decision, maybe come back a few months later and tell you, okay, this is what we got, and this is where uh, we're positioned when it comes to the rest of uh, our, uh, and it's not going to be an easy job. I've done this a few times of ripping out portions of the old stuff and making way for the new one. So uh, I actually enjoy doing that a lot. So do you have like a standard vendors you work with or do you have, you have to send out requests for quotes? Um, I don't know what you mean by standard vendor. I mean all potential suppliers or integrators as I like to call them because nobody makes all the parts complete top to bottom. Everybody buys from everybody else and slaps <coughs> it together. I prefer the <coughs> integrator. Um, I contacted about 14 integrators who do just this. And they include the big names, the Craze, the SGIs. IBM is no longer in this business. They uh, switched horses and they got out of the x86, which they sold to Lenovo. Silicon Graphics is still there, Hewlett Packard Enterprises. They like to call themselves HPE. They're still there. And then there are a number, about almost like 20 medium-sized integrators uh, that actually go to like Supermicro and they put together all the gear and give you a really good uh, HPC system. So there are about 20. We went to about 14 of them <coughs> and asked them to uh, compete and put a bit together for us. What it looks like, it's going to look something like this. They're going to be at least 300 new nodes, but each of those nodes will have probably, you know, 30 cores in each or 32 cores or something like that. Is a node like a 1U rack thing? Yeah, it's a 1U rack with maybe two or four sockets, whatever, usually two, and if you count the cores, there are at least maybe you know, 28, 32 cores on it. So you can do the math out there. And then in addition to that, we're going for the latest generation, so that's four uh, GPUs sandwiched together as one. That's called a K80. And we're looking to get four of these per node. Those are in addition to the 320. 200 of those nodes. Yes, 200 of those. Wow. And then, you know, all of these high-speed things, they need to talk to each other. 
And so it's very important to have a very, very high speed fabric. And in the high performance computing world, no question, it has to be InfiniBand. And the speeds we're talking about is 100 gigabits per second between any two nodes at any time. So, and, and that's uh, full uh, duplex, 100 gigabits one way, and they can talk 100 gigabits the other way. So can, can you give us a, a ballpark of the amount of money we're talking about? Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry, I cannot. Can't do that, but uh, it, it, it's substantial. It's and let me put it this way: it, it's worth every penny because you know we have a thousand people sure. doing research. Uh, the amount of money they have to spend on research, this is a small fraction, but yeah. it really pushes their research very far ahead. They tell us that you know we can't dream of taking our research further without this stuff. I mean. Uh, Sometimes people call this the fourth leg of uh, science. In the old days, you said, okay, let's form a theory, and then let's put on you know, white coat and do some wet science, mix beaker, or build a machine, and drill it and see. So you have experimental. And there are certain things that you cannot build a system or build a science lab to figure out whether your theory is right or not. You have to digitally simulate it. So they're saying this is our new science instrument. <coughs> it's no longer the microscope or telescope or whatever gizmo that you can build and get results. We need to use this to figure out whether even uh, uh, our theory is right or wrong or what does it say. It's getting so complex that they don't know even what theory to propose. And uh, this is something that big data comes in play. True story, I met the astronomer, uh, he's out at John Hopkins, he actually got a prize recently for something. Um, they uh, floated a satellite maybe 10 years ago to do uh, readings of the sun, all the energy at the surface inside fusion processes, etc., etc. And of course, it generated a lot of data. They were able to explain all of it. There was one data set they could not explain the energy readings at the surface of the sun. They tried and tried, and they couldn't figure it out. Somebody suggested, why don't we have the data tell us what it is actually? So they ran some machine learning algorithms on it, and it went and looked at all the patterns, and it came back with an answer. It looked at that and searched other databases, and it said, you know what? those readings actually are? Those are shock waves at the surface of the sun. Now we don't live near there, so we couldn't, but it saw in those energy pattern, it learned that these are, and those are the same kind you see whenever there's a seismic event, earthquakes and things, it matched it. If you think about it, inside the sun, you're bonding hydrogen atoms together, fusion. It releases energy, and a few other things, and we get sunlight and all that. But with the release of energy, there's also acoustic energy released. It travels to the surface as earthquakes, but after a few meters, it dissipates because there's vacuum. But they were able to take energy readings, and the data told them this is what's going on. So in the words of Donald Rumsfeld, it's telling us what we don't know. There's known unknowns, unknown unknowns. Yeah. This is a brilliant example of that. And wow, when this happened, they've started applying it everywhere so that instead of coming up with some wild theory or hypothesis, why don't the data, actual readings, tell us what's going on? And people are applying it in other places. Now, that's today, 2016, classical technology, x86, accelerators, so on and so forth. What does the future look like? And so we're talking about 2018, 2020, maybe two years from now, <coughs> what technologies would we or I be looking at and uh, fellows like me be looking at? One of them is that little chip inside your phone out there, the A6, A7, A8, whatever it is, the ARM chip. And it's not without reason that we say that's serious because if you look at this, the old Cray computer, the vector, it was kind of slowing down. It wasn't getting much faster. But you looked at microprocessors, 
their rate was much faster, and somewhere out here in 2000, they intersected. And that's when you got clusters. And then vectors went the way of the dinosaur. Now if you go forward maybe, say, 15 years, microprocessors, well, they're slowing down a little bit. But the processor chips inside phones, they're on the very same gradient as microprocessors were 15, 20 years ago. And somewhere around 2016 or 17, they're going to intersect so that these will be just as fast. But the most important thing is they'll use a lot less power. And more of them on board. Exactly. Yeah. This is what one of them looks like. We have samples. I could have brought some, but you know, the picture is pretty good out there. That uh, you can shrink it, and this probably will just use maybe five to eight watts. Here. And if you look at your Intel x86, uh, <coughs> anywhere from I don't know 95 to 135 watts. Wow. But that's not all. There are people who are saying, why don't we add a GPU to that? and get it a further boost, let him do the regular Linux sort of functions, and you do all the calculation functions. And guess what? With the low power of the ARM and the muscle power of a GPU, you actually now, in about a year, year and a half time, you'll actually have serious competition out there. That's one that we're looking at. And uh, I actually see uh, people out there um, there's a place, uh, Mont Blanc, it'll be mentioned later, <coughs> um, in uh, Europe, that actually have built a full cluster, and that's what that looks like up there, based on these ARM chips, and they've been getting some very good results. Soon as, you know, they figure out a few more things, uh, two years from now, in, instead of an Intel 86 or AMD Optron, this will be maybe a processor of choice. Yes? If you have you had a fairly even distribution of different software yes. providers. So yes. now you're going to have to convince your proprietary software provider to ship an ARM <coughs> compatible binary or whatever. Hardware yes, shipping yes. Software. And Do you foresee that being a problem, or is the market going to? I, I don't see that as a problem because 20 years ago, those same proprietary vendors said, no, we're not going to ship from IG mainframes. They shifted to, you know, uh, Many different uh, uh, boxes, sun boxes, <coughs> Solaris, they ported their stuff because the market was there. As recently as five years ago, many CAE vendors said, we'll never run on Linux. Mm -hmm. Guess what? They're all running on Linux today. <laughs> so the economics is there. It costs really cheap, and it takes a lot less power. And as soon as they have the compute capability, you have definitely droves of people saying, we're going to buy this and use it. You're open source. They're just going to retarget, recompile. Once their uh, ecosystem or ecosphere grows, then these uh, 10, 20 percenters will show up. So we've seen it happen before. <coughs> and if they say no, it's only they don't have enough volume. They haven't figured out how to make enough money. But once the volume grows, they'll be they'll <coughs> there. So, um, that's another uh, better picture of this on the inside where they actually got this running. But that's not the only competition in the next two years that we'll be looking at and others like we will be looking at. Turns out, I mentioned IBM decided to get out of the HPC business, but it was only for a short two-year interlude or something. They stopped making their older Blue Jean machine, and they sold their x86 business to Lenovo. But they had their own power chip, which was proprietary. Something happened at IBM, and they figured out that, no, we can't stay in the hardware business with just our own customers. They opened license thing. Now you actually have a consortium of more than 100 people or 100 companies that can pay the 1% royalty fee, take the design, make their own motherboard or whatever out of it. Wow. And it's growing. The biggest growth that I've seen so far is with cloud companies. On the cloud, you don't really care if it's running Linux inside or Solaris inside or any operating system. You just want to upload your Facebook picture or video or messages or whatever and uh, yeah. run it. So it turns out that they're one of the biggest adopter of the dual power. 
and uh, they're putting it up there. So let me show you that picture. Mm. So all of these people, they actually have open power running, and notice you have Google up there, wow. and uh, a few others out there that are doing, and then there are some suppliers out here as well, the Mellanox, NVIDIA, this thing will support it. And these are our motherboards. Time is making motherboard, and then there's a few others out there that you can buy open power. You don't have to buy it from IBM. You don't have to buy anything from IBM. They pay their 1%, build a board, you run Linux or whatever on it, and it's working. This is a little bit about uh, the hardware stack. I'm not going to get into it, but because I have a little more interesting stuff to talk about. How are we doing on time here? Uh, you got like 40 minutes. 40 minutes? 35, yeah. 35? OK. Yeah, I have plenty of time then. <laughs> 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 Keep you entertained. It's okay if you quit. Right? We've got other things we can do. Sure. <laughs> okay. This stuff's great. I want to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, someone earlier really asked about NVIDIA. Well, it turns out they said, gee, look how the market is changing. Look how the ecosystem is changing. We've been supplying accelerator chips. The Intels are reaping the money, and everybody else is reaping the money. They said, we should do something so that we become maybe a supplier of choice. They're not there yet. Maybe a couple more years. But they started off with something, <coughs> NVLink, which is not available today. It'll be available in a year's time. Where, remember I, how I told you, you take your x86 <coughs> motherboard, make sure you have enough PCI slots, stick an accelerator card in each. Mm -hmm. If they need to talk to each other, they got to go down to the Intel CPU say, mother may I, and then get routed and go back up to that PCI Express or quick path interconnect and talk to their thing. What they decided is to come up with something called NVLink that allows their boards to talk to each other in any way, shape, or form. You can actually make connected clusters of just the accelerator cards. You don't need your host node or host uh, CPU anymore. With that sort of thing, they're going to now provide, besides ARM, besides open power, we'll actually have a fourth supplier besides the Intel. And you know what that does when you have so much competition? Price. Economics changes. Everything changes. Yes, there's the little issue of software, but most of them, they'll all say, we'll put Linux underneath and you know, recompile, target. They'll emulate an instruction set for you. And they're pretty fast enough that you won't notice the difference here, unless you're doing some fancy stuff. So with the NVLink, they can do even more interesting things. That's all right, you can have a classical CPU one, but they can talk to each other in any way, and they're making very complicated <coughs> three-dimensional toruses of all of these talking, and make that shape match the problem that they're trying to solve. And by the way, it seems it works not just necessarily for floating point calculations or things that require equations. They've used this to do uh, image recognition. They've used this to do speech uh, uh, learning. They've used this to uh, do uh, big data as well. Because in big data, they need to move gobs of stuff back and forth. So they said, we can design something. And this is what they've released publicly for GPUs per node. But they've got stuff in the works that we're talking about hundreds and thousands of these. Here. So it is getting very, very interesting out there. Just to tell you that this is not all just talk. They actually have run many of these are uh, well-known code. That's uh, commercial code Fluent. It does aerodynamics calculations. That's why the cars now have better gas mileage or aircraft and things like that. Uh, sorting much faster. Uh, this is a physics code that I used when I was at Fermilab. Amber is a chemistry code. And then fast Fourier transforms I used almost everywhere. <coughs> um, in fact, uh, most of your uh, uh, entertainment devices has an FFT underneath the covers. Yes, question. So how do you, people, uh, you've invested for projects, you get equipment in, it goes out of date. How do you get it off your floor to make Make room. Uh, I think I sort of answered this earlier. Um, 
usually what happens is that uh, when we get grant, inside the grant funding is a little bit set aside for equipment replenishment. Really what we do is we say we proved this works, it's had a useful impact. We'd like to move it to bigger, faster equipment and that's how we get rid of the old one and bring in new stuff in. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way is I actually hate throwing away old equipment. I find ways to repurpose it. So yesterday's fast CPU, <coughs> I would repurpose and make it a filer. Or make it one of the nodes for a parallel file system. It doesn't have to be fast, we just need to have many of them. Exactly, Luster or Seth. Yeah. Um, interesting you mentioned that because one of the three positions I advertised were look, looking for a Seth uh, administrator. You've got a $5 million project to do some experiments with Seth, so mm. we need someone there. Hmm. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, we're doing lots of stuff. <coughs> you know, I talked about the data center <coughs> where we've asked for a lot of power because we're going to have all these machines. We need the floor space, we need the cooling, we need the electricity. Um, we're going to do this in a both strategic and tactical way. And not just stick to you know your traditional x86, whatever, but even look at ARM, put ARM in, run the same code. Hey, if it's faster, uses less power, it's cheaper. Maybe that's our future and grow it. But we will try it. We won't do anything on blind faith. But the most important thing is actually have people you know, they're the key in all of this. It's not like, you know, oh, throw hardware at it or dollars at it, it'll solve itself. No people actually make it work. So that's what we expect to uh, see and use some of these technologies yeah. in the not too far future, maybe two years from now. Yeah. A lot of the stuff you're showing us is throwing more hardware at it. Seems like some gains could really be made by, that you mentioned real early on that uh, they don't write software very efficiently. Uh, the seems bioinformatics like, people, yeah. But yeah, like for them, have, yeah, we, we have to throw some money at larger memory for them. But most yeah. of the other folks, they actually look seriously at the code and optimize it and do things like that. So like they're definitely a big part. So this is 2018. <laughs> probably, maybe, you know, maybe one day. I think you and I talked about it is maybe in the summer when the weather is good, we can actually have a mug meeting out there or something like that show you around, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's get a lot of these in place, not sure. too far. Yeah. We've been around since 85, we'll be there in 2020, <laughs> yeah. 2019. So this is stuff that's not far away. In the next couple of years, we're likely to see it. I also want to tell you what is beyond 2020 as well that people are working on. So let me uh, get that. turns out that beyond, initially they said it might happen in 2018. I was one of those who said, I don't think so. And it turns out they've been quietly pushing the predicted date a little past that. So it's somewhere <coughs> beyond 2020. And it actually has a name. It's called the exascale era. Remember I talked about floating point operation to a thousand, the floating point we call flops, floating point operation to second thousand K flops, then you have mega flops, million, giga flops, and so on. Well, um, hmm? the exa scale, exa comes from uh, this Greek word six, which is a thousand to the power six, which turns out to be 10 to the 18, or basically a billion billion <coughs> calculations per second. And it turns out it has a name, quintillion. Now it's not the name of the store owner down by uh, rural county you just passed the other day. It's actually a uh, real thing. But that's a lot of calculations <coughs> per second yet. And then you say, why do we need it yet? Well, it turns out that there are some ambitious people and governments, may I add, <laughs> and governments, it's not necessarily ours, but a few others, that they want this processing power because they want to tackle some very, very, very ambitious one uh, spot in the world actually says, 
we want this kind of machine so that we can simulate a human brain. And so uh, they're putting a lot of money. And this is what you can expect to see 2020. Even if they don't build it, I uh, know enough from experience that the technologies that they try in order to build it, those spin-offs, I think that's what you might call it, those spin-offs itself would change a lot of things, just like the spin